so Derek Butenhus uh, is unable to be present at the conference, uh, but he recorded this uh, video of his presentation. He's also um, participating remotely via the live stream. Um, so you can all follow him on Twitter to ask him questions during his, uh, this video that will play his presentation. Um, and also he uh, just dumped his uh, Twitter handle into the collaborative notes. Um, so you can find that there as well. And it's also right, right there in the video. Um, so yeah, feel free. And um, he'll be here tomorrow if you have any additional questions. Or he'll be participating remotely tomorrow. Couldn't make it to Budapest this year, but hopefully you'll enjoy my disembodied voice speaking about FFV1 in Go instead. In case anyone doesn't know what FFV1 is, it's a lossless video codec, uh, primarily used in the archival world. I'm sure most of you in the audience probably know what it is. And I've written a brand new decoder from scratch in Go, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that today and why. So why did I write it? Um, mostly because it seemed pretty fun. It seemed interesting to try and implement something from only a spec and have no code references um, as really a good way to test out the spec, its robustness and clarity. But mainly, uh, the goal was to make the spec better. Uh, the idea being that the more people who implement it, uh, the more bugs are found in the spec, and the more people who implement it from only the spec, the more kind of weird little niggling things that maybe don't make sense outside of the context of a reference encoder uh, would be found. I mean, it seems like a pretty good way to spend a weekend or like 10 weekends, right? So let's see how that went. The first point is that um, specs aren't exactly written in a uh, like logical order. It's not like do this, then this, then this. It's not a step-by-step -step guide. It's more of a reference than anything. And having a second monitor really helps, like, so you could reference back and forth between the code you're writing and uh, the spec itself. And for example, uh, pseudocode in one spec, say, you know, 2.1, will reference a variable from pseudocode in another part of the spec, say, 3.2, but they're not necessarily in that order. So you'll have to jump around up and down quite a bit. And uh, if you're trying to write, like, a logical flow in a decoder, that can get kind of disorienting. So as you may have guessed, um, turns out that third-party implementations are really important for the robustness of a spec. Uh, I found while implementing the FFV1 spec that there were a lot of little bits that either weren't in the spec, were wrong in the spec, or like only existed in code itself. Um, I guess Raw Coke must have referenced the reference encoder at some points too, because I don't know how else they would have like figured some of this stuff out. Um, but as a result of that, uh, we improved the spec. I opened lots of bugs, sent some pull requests. Um, so the end result is that the FFV1 spec is better than it would have been if I hadn't done this. And that kind of, was kind of the point because uh, a better specification is better for everyone. And these bugs ranged from anything like uh, context size was just kind of entirely missing from the spec. Uh, which is, is just a constant value, or that there were some edge cases in the spec that uh, that the spec technically allowed, but that the reference encoders uh, simply didn't allow. So this next one may or may not be a little controversial, but I think having background and context in the spec itself and not shunted in an annex somewhere or hidden in a proposal on a mailing list that's archived from 10 years ago is uh, extremely useful. Like um, a lot of, a lot of the implementations benefit from knowing why something is the way it is. And FV1 has a lot of this in its spec and it became quite useful, especially for things like slice multi-threading. Uh, spec purists might say, oh, a spec's only supposed to be a reference. But my, my retort would be, the spec is meant to help people implement your thing. And if background and context is what is needed to implement this thing, it should be in the spec. So this next one uh, should be pretty obvious, but uh, having direct contact with the people who wrote the spec in the first place is pretty useful. Um, just, I use this uh, all the time when I work on AV1 stuff, and uh, I had to use it a few times when working on uh, the FV1 decoder. Um, uh, you can see a little example of it here on the side of the slide um, uh, where I found a thing. I didn't know why it was that way. 
was kind of missing from the spec. It was in both the encoder uh, and the decoders. And I was wondering, well, why is it this thing? Turns out it's only like that because um, it was, it was a, a, basically a speed hack to make decoding faster, but it didn't, uh, it wasn't technically fully spec compliant. So uh, that's having that kind of access over Twitter or mailing list or IRC or whatever to the people who wrote the spec is uh, obviously extremely useful. And obviously this isn't feasible with every spec all the time, but you'd be surprised how accessible a lot of the authors are and how happy they are to help you. So this next one uh, is kind of specific to FFV1 in so much as uh, FFV1 was written after the FFV1 uh, reference encoder had been used in production and all sorts of other things for years and years. So it's, it was basically deriving a specification from a code base and uh, that leads to like all sorts of little weird intricacies and behaviors that are uh, somewhat unexpected. Um, like one, one of the ones uh, that I referenced in the previous slide about um, uh, like that's specific to the reference encoder's behavior that the decoder was relying on. Um, one of the ones that caught me by guard when writing this was that for a 16-bit RGB mode, uh, you actually need 17-bit buffers for prediction, which is uh, kind of annoying since no other mode needs this. And I guess it's kind of, uh, it was kind of glossed over and not mentioned in the spec because they assumed you'd be predicting the same way you would be in the reference encoder, which is not a full buffer, but just a few lines or just surrounding context. And this makes sense if you're like implementing an optimized decoder, but maybe makes less sense if you're implementing a reference or uh, trying to make write code that's very obvious. The flip side to this is that since the spec was written based off an optimized decoder, it has some parts in it uh, that can help you optimize your decoder, such as uh, tips on how to slice multi-thread more easily. Um, so this was probably my biggest, uh, let's call it issue with, this, with the FFV1 spec, but uh, I'm not entirely sure how I should file a bug about this. So uh, the range uh, coder is in the spec as basically a bunch of latex. So it's a bunch of math notation. And uh, this is really not the greatest for actually writing code based off of. Like, yes, yes, it has uh, the reference to the original paper, which in itself has, uh, it's missing some constants and stuff, which are in the, in the latex in the spec. but it's really annoying to actually implement code based off nothing but some latex math. And I'm gonna be entirely truthful here. My range coder is partly based off the Wikipedia definition because throwing a bunch of latex at me is a pretty crap way to get me to actually implement something well, um, especially with kind of no background or context in how it works. Um, so the Golong coder, for example, had pseudocode and that was a lot easier, but I guess you don't really come around come away with uh, a deeper understanding of how a golem rice coder works. I mean, I, I already had that, but um, I was less familiar with uh, range coding. Um, I was familiar with arithmetic coding, but not range coding. And uh, uh, yeah, so Wikipedia implementation. Um, I don't know how exactly I would file a bug for this other than like, let's put some pseudo code in and remove the math bits. but. I don't know, that doesn't seem particularly useful for a spec. Um, yeah. Anyway, on to some code notes. Um, it is written in Go, but it's not 100% like idiomatic Go because I wanted to make it a good reference, uh, which is almost a little more C-like and it should stick like really close to the spec pseudocode, which is obviously based off C. Um, Every, every function and variable and stuff is annotated with references to the spec sections where they're from and their titles. Um, I did use a little bit of Perl for code generation for 16-bit prediction stuff. Um, never do that. Um, but hopefully it should be pretty easy reading even for someone who isn't necessarily familiar with Go and that was kind of the goal here rather than having an optimized decoder. Um, it is pretty slow right now. I think it's like, Two, two or three times slower than FFmpeg, maybe a little more than that, but um, it does have slice uh, threading. 
And uh, yeah, uh, here's some links to the implementation, its documentation, uh, a little simple Matroska wrapper I wrote because turns out Go has really, really crappy Go, uh, or sorry, really, really crappy Matroska packages. So I kind of just wrapped Hallie's Matroska parser and used that to get my packets out. And of course the spec. Uh, I guess we'll open it up to questions now. And again, if you have any questions, um, he's on the live stream chat. Thank you, virtual Derek. 